Do you know what the Franks, Lombards, Vandals, and Huns have in common? They are all tribes that conquered parts of Europe. The Huns were fierce nomads who were probably feared more than any tribe in history. Their skilled horsemen had something that other people didn't, stirrups to help with their balance while they fought. They attacked Europe between the 3rd and 5th centuries. Their most ruthless leader was Attila the Hun, who was born around 406 AD. The Romans thought he was sent as a punishment. They called him the Scourge of God. Several other tribes migrated from the northeast around 400 AD. They are called Germanic tribes because their languages were similar to modern-day German. Many of these people were farmers and herders. They adopted Christianity and settled in Europe. They did not have a writing system or cities. These tribes included the Franks, Goths, Vandals, Burgundians, Lombards, and Alemanni. They ruled Europe between 400 and 700 AD. The Visigoths moved into Roman territory in the 300s. They feared the Huns and agreed to be loyal to Rome. The Romans did not treat them fairly. They even made some Visigoth slaves. A Visigoth leader named Alaic decided to fight the Romans. In 410, the Visigoths destroyed Rome. What do you think the Romans could have done to keep them from rebelling? The Ostrogoths conquered most of Italy, Greece, and the Western Balkans. The Vandals conquered Spain. They raided Italy and conquered the Visigoths in 455. We get the word Vandal, meaning a person who deliberately destroys property, from the Vandals. One of the strongest kingdoms, the Franks, began around 481 AD. Their leader Clovis conquered the Roman area called Gaul. As different Germanic tribes fought each other, the defeated tribes were given a choice. They could leave the area or stay and live with the winning tribe. The tribes that lived together began to merge, which led to the beginning of large nations. Another era of invasion occurred between the 800s and 1000s. The Muslims came from the south, the nomadic Magyars came from the east, and the Vikings came from the north. The Vikings weren't a single group, but they shared the Norse language. They came from the Scandinavian countries of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. They dominated Europe from about 750 to 1100 AD, a time called the Viking Age. Because of their poor land and cold weather, the Vikings relied on the sea for their food. They built longships to sail to other lands to trade, raid, and steal. The ships had colorful wool sails, but also about 100 men who would row if there was no wind. From Iceland to Russia to Constantinople and down the rivers of Europe, the Vikings made their mark, terrifying those who stood in their way. Viking explorer Eric the Red discovered Iceland in about 982 and Greenland a few years later. Historians believe that his son Leif Erikson may have come to North America about 500 years before Columbus. Eventually, the Vikings merged into the European culture. English words like husband, window, and egg come from the Norse language. So a little short video there, of course, about the migration period. Of course, one of the things that leads to the end of the Roman Empire, especially in the West. So, hey, welcome you back, Daniel Simon, Baton Rouge Community College. And of course, last week, really, of my main lectures, of course, I'll have for uh, spring semester 2023. So, everybody had a great weekend, uh, of course, uh, overall. Uh, I'll be kind of wrapping up, you know, talking about the Roman Empire this week, because that's going to go, of course, towards your final exam I've got coming up, which probably posting that next week, uh, of course. But it looks like right now I do have a few students I know watching live. Uh, right now. I know Tristan's watching. Hey, good morning, Tristan. And it looks like Kelsey. Hey, what's up, Kelsey? Uh, good morning. Uh, also, Alex is also joining us this morning as well, uh, along with Becky. Hey, good morning, Becky. And then, of course, looks like also Samantha is also joining us uh, as as well. So, yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about, of course, like uh, reminders about assignments coming up, uh, especially the end of the semester, some assignments. I'll kind of give it to you right now, but I'll show you a kind of a list later of different things that you're going to have to turn in uh, at the end. I know right now we have that vocab, that third vocab that's still out. Um, I'll probably leave it open this week, uh, but that's I know that's one of the last vocab assignments that do have uh, for the semester. But book reports, of course, coming due uh, later in the week. 
uh, I think on April 28th, Friday. I know that uh, early Roman history quiz, I gave that to you last week. Uh, that's going to be due at the end of the semester. And then those are some of the assignments on the bottom you see there uh, that are going to be due uh, by, the, by finals, uh, Friday, May 12th, I think is the last date when those will be due. Final exam on the Roman Empire. Now, we'll have a Middle Ages uh, bonus quiz of, for extra credit uh, at the end of the semester, uh, which is going to be based on some recorded lectures I have, previous lectures I have. Of course, I'll give you probably later in the week. So I'll, I'll show you a slide of that later I've got, uh, and I'll post it in Canvas announcements today, too, some all the different things that will, of course, be uh, upcoming that are going to be due uh, at the end of the spring semester. So he's kind of just talking about that for now. Uh, but like I said, today I did want to go ahead uh, and wrap up uh, discussing uh, what happened to the Roman Empire. So uh, today's lecture, I'll you know, kind of get into the decline and collapse of the Roman Empire. We, of course, have the Western Empire uh, that collapses uh, by the late 5th century. And then you do have the continuation of the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, which historians later call the Byzantine uh, Empire. So I'll kind of briefly talk about that uh, today. Uh, so like I said, it's like my last lecture, you know, in course, live lecture anyway, I'm going to do a course for the semester that will have. So uh, yeah, if you have any comments, questions during the live stream, do let me know. Of course, you can always leave comments on my channel. Uh, also, don't forget students, you can remember uh, to send comments to me uh, in uh, Canvas discussions online uh, as well. So you we get bonus points, of course, for that uh, as well. So, yeah, let me get into, I think, where we were last time. If I remember correctly, I talked about uh, the Severa dynasty. I think that was that major dynasty that took over after Commodus was assassinated, if you remember correctly, at 192. Uh, and uh, then we talked about that dynasty. And then I started getting into a new period that comes in that's called the crisis of the third century. Uh, which occurs like over about a 50-year period in the middle of the 3rd century. Uh, and uh, this happened right after Severus Alexander. He was the last Severan emperor. He was killed. He was assassinated by a Praetorian guard, I believe, his own people. Uh, and that brought on this crisis period, uh, which went on for about 50 years. And the Roman Empire actually almost collapsed, literally. Uh, imploded. Uh, I'll get to it later. It really almost breaks up uh, at one point as well. They do have different nicknames for it, by the way. They sometimes call it the um, military anarchy, I think is one name. Some people call it the imperial crisis period uh, as well. But you can see those are the years down there, 235 uh, to 284 uh, is the time period of it. Uh, and uh, during that time, uh, not just civil war uh, that broke out, but uh, they had barbarian invasions into the country as well. So you get different barbarians. We, you saw that short video at the beginning, uh, all the different peoples that start trying to attack the Roman Empire. So you get that happening. Plagues also have more of those kind of outbreaks uh, as well. Uh, a lot of uh, economic uncertainty, depressions kind of occur. One big thing that happened, too, was that the currency became debased. It wasn't really worth much. They took a lot of the minerals out of it. You also have a lot of emperors that get assassinated is another thing that happens as well. In fact, during that 50-year period, there was something like around 20 emperors, maybe 26 that tried to claim the throne. Uh, and a lot of the emperors were called sometimes barracks emperors or another name they were called were soldier emperors uh, because of the fact that they came out of the Roman armies and all that. Uh, another thing that happened here, which is really crazy uh, during the whole uh, crisis period, uh, you have this so-called uh, year of the six emperors where in 238 CE or AD, you had a deal where there were six emperors that really ranked. Uh, Maximinus Trax, I think, had been emperor for a few years. Then he had several emperors that tried to take power. Gordian I and his son, Gordian II. Uh, there was also another one named Papianus, Balbinus. Then there was also a Gordian III, who I think was related back to Gordian I and II. And so you have this deal where 
basically, I think the military tries to kind of take over the empire. That's how that's how bad things were, where you have six emperors in, in you know at one year, you know that's almost like two months an emperor if you think about that. Uh, and so that's the kind of anarchy that was kind of going on uh, during that period. Uh, then they also had another deal you see here where the empire broke up into three different states. Uh, I kind of look at this right here, but you had uh, the Gaelic Empire uh, that, of course, formed in the West. Uh, there was also one which was the Palmarine Empire, which was in the East. The Gaelic Empire was supposed to be like Gaul and part of Germany and Britain. Uh, and then you can see the Palmarine Empire was in the East, uh, included like parts of like Turkey, Syria, uh, Israel, and Egypt that were in it. Uh, and then you see they had a Italian-centered, independent Roman Empire, of course, that was in the middle. Uh, this went off, by the way, for about almost 10 years uh, that the empire went through this kind of period. So it could have broken up, you know, at that point, and that would have been the end of the Roman Empire. But uh, they had this emperor that came in named Aurelian, uh, who only reigned around five years. You can see 270 to 275. And um, he's important because uh, they think he's one of the main emperors that helps to reunite the empire and put it back together. So it's like Humpty Dumpty, got to put it back together. <laughs> uh, and he helps end the crisis period. And then I'll get to Emperor Diocletian later. He comes in and starts doing reforms that kind of help end it as well. Uh, but he was this militaristic type emperor that really forced those two empires back into the Roman Empire. Uh, he also had to deal with fighting barbarians, like various tribes that were trying to attack the empire uh, as well. So he had to fight like the Goths and other different peoples that were attacking the empire uh, as well. Uh, and um, Aurelian um, got this nickname, you can see. He was called the Restorer of the World, is what the Roman Senate called him, uh, and so he was able to put the empire back together uh, because of that, his military, you know, uh, successes. Yeah, there are always different, um, uh, different, you know, tribes that are trying to attack. So you have the Franks, Alemanni, Vandals, different Goth, Gothic tribes uh, also as well. So he had to fight off all these different tribes uh, that were trying to, you know, invade into the Roman Empire, which they'd been doing before. Uh, overall. So after that, he's able to bring all those sections of the empire that are out back in. Uh, oh, oh, the other thing he did too, which is really famous, uh, he actually, after that, um, in that same period, he also constructed what they call the Aurelian Walls. Uh, these were new fortifications that were built to protect Rome from being attacked by you know different barbarians. And like I said, it superseded the ancient Servian walls, uh, which had been built a long time ago under the Roman monarchy. I think I've got a map showing you different pictures of it you can look at, uh, but it's named after Emperor you know, Aurelian. Uh, and uh, I think the average walls were about, originally built to about 26 feet tall, but later walls were expanded uh, to close to like 50 feet. Uh, in height. Uh, and here's some aerial views, of course, of the wall in modern Rome today. Uh, but you can see it even, even had some, uh, you know, gates that were built into it uh, as well with watchtowers. And uh, you can see the area kind of surrounds a lot of the main area of, of Rome, where, you know, where the original seven walls is and the, you know, the original Servian wall that's there. Uh, and so that helped to kind of, I guess, prevent Rome from falling, which Rome won't really be officially attacked again until like the 5th century, when that, that'll happen. So yeah, so I'm, I'm going to move on next. I did want to talk about this other emperor, of course, they had that came to power, which was uh, Emperor Diocletian. Uh, he's kind of an important uh, ruler that comes in. Diocletian reigned uh, from about 284 uh, to 305. He's important because he helps come in and he also helps to end that crisis period that we were talking about. Uh, and um, I think he rose up from like lower class background, believe it or not. I think I want to say his father was the 
son of a slave or something like that, uh, that kind of deal. He rose up through the military and the Praetorian Guard uh, and um, eventually became the ruler in the East. Actually, I think is what happens later. He's going to be like the Eastern Augustus. I'll get to that in a second. But he's basically the emperor at that point of the whole empire. Uh, and um, so he helps to stabilize it. Uh, and uh, he mostly does this through various reforms that he does to the Roman Empire. And um, one of the first things he does is he uh, creates a new title for the emperor. And he begins adopting which a lot of emperors use later. And that's the title, which is Dominus, the Dominus title, uh, which is a title that meant uh, either Lord or Master. And it was like an autocratic title saying that, you know, the ruler was uh, not really a prin princeps now, princeps, as they say it, which was the old title, uh, which meant first citizen. Almost like he was like the head of like a republic or something like that. So he got rid of that pretension of that, and the ruler is more of an autocratic type rule uh, overall. So that actually begins a new period in the Roman Empire, uh, which is called the Dominate Period, because uh, of that title being used by the Roman emperors. And uh, from 284 up to 476, the Western Empire uses it. And then I think the Eastern Empire still uses it too uh, for a while after that as well. Uh, here's kind of a slide more, of course, about some of the things he did with reform. So you got the title Adominus uh, he adopted as well. Uh, the big thing he's known for, uh, Diocletian, uh, is the Roman Tetrarchy. Uh, the Tetrarchy was this Roman system of governance where they had four rulers that ran the empire instead of just having one emperor. Uh, and uh, there were two rulers. One, they had an Augustus, one in the West and one in the East. And then they had two Caesars, one in the West and one in the East. Uh, the, the Augustus or Augusti, which is the, I guess, the plural version, uh, was like the main emperors they had. So you had two emperors that are one. Uh, and then you had these two uh, successor emperors that were under them as well. Uh, and uh, Diocletian became one of the rulers in the East, uh, is what would happen in Eastern Augustus. Now, I think I've got a, a thing showing it right here uh, with the Western Augustus uh, in the Eastern Augustus. And uh, Diocletian was set up in the East, you can see. Uh, and then he put in power a uh, Western Augustus named Maximian. And those two actually ruled together uh, for almost 20 years, to like close to 305. And then in the West and East, they had these Caesars. They had uh, Constantius was the Western Caesar. And then they had Galerius was the Eastern Caesar uh, that was in the East. So you can see that, too, uh, in that uh, little slide right there. Uh, and um, one of the things that happens, if you know about this, it later helps to divide the Roman Empire in half. Uh, you got the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire which is later called also Byzantine uh, as well. Uh, over time, they have capitals. Uh, well, the Western Empire has Rome originally. It's later moved uh, to the city of Ravenna. Uh, and then the one in the east, Byzantine, uh, is the capital Constantinople, now Istanbul. Uh, by the way, the word tetrarchy uh, is a Greek word uh, from the word uh, tetrarchia, uh, which means, um, put it on the screen if you want, tetrarchia. It means rule by four, or some people also say leadership by four. So the rulers are called tetrarchs, I think is the common term uh, that they'll, they'll use. It's almost like having four kings or almost four emperors, uh, in a sense, two senior emperors and two junior emperors uh, that you have. And uh, the tetrarchy was important. It did kind of create stability for around you know, 15, 20 years, uh, and it allowed line of secession. Uh, so, you know, the Augustus of the East and the West would sometimes pick a successor, and then they would take take over afterwards um, in West and East. And I guess the whoever took over would then choose their successor below them. So it made rule more effective. And so basically each ruler would reign over a certain section, like one-fourth of the empire. I think here's kind of a map showing you, too, kind of how they broke it up among the four rulers right here. 
Uh, but you can see the era where Diocletian had it was mostly like Turkey, Syria, and Egypt right there. Uh, you can see uh, Maximian had Italy, Spain, Africa. Uh, Constantius ruled over like Gaul and Britain. And then you can see also uh, uh, Galerius. Looks like he reigned over um, Dalmatia, like where Yugoslavia used to be, in mostly Greece. So those are the areas that they kind of controlled uh, overall. Uh, you'll also notice they've got a thing there where they divided it up into what they call uh, dioceses, uh, which over time dioceses will later be like these church uh, districts where uh, bishops, you know, rule over like the different parts of the empire and later the Catholic Church domains and stuff like that. And that kind of came out of that originally out of the Tetrarchy. Uh, if you go back to uh, that other slide right there, uh, there's a few other things that uh, Diocletian was also known for as well. He also had this thing called the uh, Edict of Maximum Prices that he had. Uh, there was a real bad period of inflation under this time, which they think a lot of had to do with the currency, uh, was just kind of debased, uh, if you know about that. Uh, and so uh, he tried to set, like, um, prices on price fixes on everything, uh, even like wage fixes and stuff like that. I think I've got a slide showing that too, uh, the different ones. I think I've got, let me show you this other map I've got too. I didn't show you also as well. Here's kind of another map showing the first Tetrarchy uh, as well. You want to look at that later. But uh, yeah, here's example. So they would set these uh, maximum wages and prices uh, that were fixed like even people's wages were fixed and things like that. And uh, it was actually unpopular. People didn't like it. And I think it was a case where they basically ignored it. Uh, and so it never really worked out. And I think it wasn't really until Constantine the Great came in that they were able to fix everything with creating better currency and things like that. Uh, but yeah, inflation was a big, big problem, you know, going back to the third century and uh, under Diocletian's reign. Now, there is one thing he is famous for, Diocletian, uh, which uh, he's notorious for, which he got connected with him. But uh, it was actually a, a case where for about 10 years, the Romans instigated the last persecution of Christians uh, throughout the empire. Uh, it was called the Diocletianic Persecution. And then the Catholic Church later called it the Great Persecution. Just kind of exaggerated, they think. Uh, but they're not sure. They, they think it's not really his idea. They think it was actually Galerius, I think, was one of the um, rulers that kind of the Tetrarch that kind of supported the idea more than anything. Uh, and so starting in 303, what happened in the empire, they banned Christians from uh, being like in the government uh, or being in the Roman military. Uh, and uh, if you didn't give, you know, tribute to like, you know, the, the traditional pagan gods and things like that, uh, you, you could be persecuted. Uh, and so the whole Diocletianic persecution was really an attempt to save the traditional Roman religions. Uh, they were kind of declining uh, at the time. And uh, you have to understand that, uh, kind of give you an idea of Christianity, uh, between 250 up to about 300, uh, the actual population of Christians in the Roman Empire, it increased drastically. It went from like around a million people to about six million. Uh, and so that's had a lot to do with it. They think that may have been 10% or more of the actual population. Uh, and so um, people weren't going to the temples. They were going to like a church instead, I guess. Uh, and so they attempted it, but in the end, it actually failed. In fact, I think it made more people sympathetic towards Christianity. Uh, and so uh, later, of course, we'll get to it. Various edicts are passed later, which bans that. And Christianity eventually over time will become one of the main religions of the Roman Empire. Uh, yeah, Diocletian was known for his building projects. Like he built like the so-called baths of Diocletian. I think that was kind of considered some of the last, uh, you know, baths were built in Rome uh, that were well known. Uh, and he also was known for his palace. He had this famous palace that he built 
uh, which is now in Croatia, Diocletian's Palace, or the Palace of Diocletian. And uh, if you know what happened uh, in 305 CE, Diocletian retired. He had health issues. He wasn't able to do his job. Uh, and so he decided to retire. And if you know what happened, he made the emperor in the West retire too, uh, as well. Uh, the Western Augustus had to retire uh, also. Uh, and so he stepped down. So I think they they say that Diocletian was one of the first emperors in, in like Roman history to actually retire, uh, which he did on his own. I think he would die about six years later, uh, around 311 or 312 is when he died. Now, the only thing is, I'm going to get to this in a second, it's going to create a civil war uh, that, that breaks out. Uh, there's going to be this case where uh, they call they have what they call the civil wars, the tetrarchy that break out, especially in the West. Uh, this kind of infighting over who should be the ruler. Uh, and it occurs over like 18 years, 306 to 324, uh, is the last stage uh, of the Tetrarchy. Uh, after that, they get rid of it, uh, the Romans. And uh, there was a Roman general that was in the West. His name was Constantine. They later call him Constantine the First uh, or Constantine the Great. Also, Saint Constantine, uh, I think in the Catholic Orthodox churches as well. And uh, he was actually the son of Constantius, uh, who was one of the rulers that took over uh, in the West. Uh, and um, but what happened was apparently after he became the ruler, um, I think I think he was one of the rulers in the West. He died, he dropped dead, uh, and so his son tried to take the throne and all that, and that's what kind of creates the mess. I'll get to Constantine in a second, right there. But here's kind of a map of what things would look like, of course, uh, in in the West. This was after. Uh, Diocletian was stepped down. So you had Constantius and Maxentius were the rulers uh, that were in the West. And in the East, you had two rulers, uh, which were Max Licinius and Maximianus. Those are kind of the rulers they had by about 311. Uh, however, what happened was in the West, there was a bunch of infighting that occurred uh, between the rulers. You had Constantine, of course, the great later that, of course, wanted the throne because uh, his father had died, Constantius. Uh, and um, there were two other men that wanted the throne, too. Uh, they had Maxentius and they had Maximianus. Uh, Maximianus uh, was the original Augustus in the West. Uh, that was, I think, with under with, with Diocletian. And then he had a son named uh, Maximianus. They had as well, or Maximian, I think for short. He wanted the throne, too as well. So you had these three different men uh, that wanted to fight over it. Uh, and uh, what happened eventually was that, uh, I think what happened was Maximianus, uh, he was uh, eventually forced to kill himself. He committed suicide, I want to say in 310 uh, in the war. And then the most pivotal thing that happened, of course, uh, Battle of Milvian Bridge, uh, which happened in 312, Constantine marched on Rome uh, and defeated Maxentius's forces uh, close to Rome, or right outside of Rome. A uh, bridge called Milvian Bridge uh, happened October 28, 312, and Maxentius uh, died in the battle. I think he fell in the river, drowned. Uh, and uh, suppose there's a story where Constantine, at that battle, decided to convert to Christianity. Uh, suppose he was a deal where he saw some kind of sign of a cross in the air uh, and, and basically decided that he was going to you know, become Christian after that. And so he would later adopt to Christianity and become the first Christian emperor of the Roman Empire. Uh, there's kind of a debate about whether that happened or not. Uh, some people think that might be a story uh, that Christian writers made up about Constantine. Uh, they do know that he becomes sympathetic towards Christians He's baptized on, on his deathbed, Constantine. Uh, so, yeah, Constantine, they think, converts over to Christianity uh, at that point. Uh, they do have a deal where Constantine and now the ruler in the East uh, is a ruler named Galerius. Those two basically come together and they issue edicts that end the persecution of Christians. 
uh, at that point. There's actually two edicts that do this, uh, not really one. Uh, the first edict was issued by Galerius. He was the Eastern Augustus, which was called the East, uh, Edict of Toleration, or also called the Edict of Certica, issued in 311 uh, in the Eastern Roman Empire. And you can see what it did was it ended a lot of the persecutions that were in the Eastern Roman Empire. It also made Christianity a legal religion uh, as well. So Romans could practice that religion. It was accepted by the Roman Empire uh, as well, along with other religions that they had. Uh, and then Constantine uh, had his own edict in the West called the Edict of Milan. He issued in 313 in Italy. Uh, and that one did the same thing except in the West is what it did. So it gave legal status, of course, uh, to the to Christianity there. Uh, and so um, over time, what's going to happen, you know, is that Christianity is going to become the main religion of the Roman Empire. But at that point, the middle of the fourth century, uh, you can practice Christianity and other religions uh, like pagan religions as well. Now, one thing that's going to happen, so there you go, there's Constantine the Great. He's going to eventually combine the empire together. Uh, one thing that's going to occur, uh, Galerius actually dies of a horrible illness. So they, they think it was maybe either gangrene uh, or cancer he had, uh, apparently. And this other ruler in the, in, the, uh, West, in the East, excuse me, Eastern Augustus, Licinius would take over. And those two came to loggerheads. Constantine and Licinius didn't get along, and it led to a civil war again, the end of the Tetrarchy Civil War. And uh, eventually Constantine defeated him in 324 and seized control of the Roman Empire. And so after that, uh, you can see uh, with this map, uh, Augustus will actually go on to rule over the whole empire by himself as sole ruler for about 13 years, 324 uh, to 337. You can see here, by the way, uh, how he progresses with that. Uh, so at one point, he only controlled the Western part, like Britain, France, and Spain, uh, when he was like just a Western Caesar. Uh, then he became the Western Augustus. And then after that, he became the sole ruler uh, of the Roman Empire as well. And so with that, one thing that came out of it, if you know about it, was that uh, Constantine then started making reforms to the Christian church, uh, which uh, was kind of starting to kind of organize uh, at that point better. And he convened what became known as the First Consul of Nicaea, uh, which they met in the northern part of Turkey uh, in, in 325 CE. And uh, the First Consul of Nicaea, there was actually a second one later, uh, was like a church consul or some people call it an ecumenical consul between the various cleric officials of this church. They went there to uh, lay the foundations of the church, uh, also to deal with like theological issues with the church. What books were they going to, you know, be part of the church as well, like the later future books that are in like the New Testament and all that. We'll kind of just start deciding that there and afterwards. And um, they had different issues that uh, at this uh, council in 325 when they met. One of the big issues that really caused problems uh, in the fourth century in the Roman Empire was this issue over the nature of God, especially Jesus. Like what is Jesus and all that? Uh, divinity-wise, uh, and they had this thing called Arianism or the Arian controversy that was kind of taking over the empire, which had started Egypt. Uh, and uh, I've got a picture of Arius right here. Arius was this, um, they think, a Christian presbyter that um, they think tried to make this idea that um, God was not like one thing. It was actually two things, like a father and son. Uh, and what Arius believed was that the father had beget the son, like the father had created the son, like Jesus. And he thought that the father was actually greater than Jesus, uh, which was kind of a controversy. So you have these almost like two co-eternal gods that you have instead of like, say, one God. And so this was like a big controversy uh, within within the, the church at the time. 
Uh, and so they think what happened because of that, it led to the creation of these two things you see on the right. Uh, the Trinity was developed, uh, the Trinitarianism, you know, uh, and then the Nicene Creed uh, was also adopted uh, as well. Uh, the Trinity, of course, was this idea that um, the doctrine of like what God was, uh, was that God is one God, but exists in in the form of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, basic there. And then the one on the right, you see uh, the Nicene Creed uh, is a Christian statement of like faith or belief, uh, on, you know, in Christianity, Jesus, the Trinity, and it was put into the Christian mass uh, is what eventually happened. And the reason why they did this, by the way, this profession of faith, they put in, like they say, the mass, uh, was to stamp out the heresy of Arianism. That was the reason why they did it uh, in the fourth century. So Trinity and all that did not exist uh, before the fourth century. Go back to the time of Jesus and all that, uh, when Christianity first developed. Now this exists uh, until the fourth century. Uh, another thing, too, uh, they decided on, if you know about it, uh, in from here on out, you know, in the fourth century, they decided what books were going to be uh, in the New Testament. I know they kind of started to select which gospel accounts uh, would be considered canonized right there. Uh, so, yeah, obviously, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those are the ones that kind of are included. Acts, uh, Paul's letters are included, general letters, and the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, are eventually, you know, added uh, as well. Uh, and, um, they think that the books of the New Testament uh, were, they think they were compiled eventually uh, by about 400, uh, at least later. They start trying to compile it right now, but uh, by the time of like St. Jerome, you know, who you know, helps to, you know, write the Bible together, uh, he's the one that's really going to, you know, form it together uh, as a whole, like a Latin translation, all that. Uh, and they originally, you know, include, in the beginning, 27 books of the New Testament. And then they also add the Old Testament as well, uh, which has 39 books uh, in it as well. Uh, they also think at that time, the uh, first council of Nicaea also set when Easter would be. They'd say it was in the spring time, uh, coincide close to when Passover is, although they didn't want to have it the same time as when the Jews had it. Uh, but it's basically around the same time, and sometimes even falls at the same time occasionally. But it's all because of the moon, you know, basically. It's why it's off. Uh, and then uh, Sunday Sabbath, I think, is something that they start kind of also push, because in the Roman Empire, under Constantine and afterwards, uh, this Sunday Sabbath kind of becomes like a day of rest. It's something you start seeing uh, up through medieval times and so on. That's something that kind of follows uh, also as later. So, yeah, there's other ecumenical consuls of the church will have later, but this is really the one that really set the tone uh, for what would be the Christian church uh, over time. Then, of course, by the Middle Ages, the church is going to split. You're going to go from like this Orthodox church uh, in the East, the Catholic church in the West. That'll happen over time. Uh, now, uh, one other thing that Constantine did, you may have heard about, that's really famous. Uh, he, besides the Council of Nicaea, of course, the big thing he's well, well known for, uh, Constantinople. If you know about that, he founded it, they think, in 330, new capital of the Roman Empire, uh, which uh, Constantine wanted a city that was a Christian city because Rome was still kind of considered like social with paganism, all that. Uh, and so he founds this new city in the east, uh, and now what is part of western Turkey, uh, right below the Black Sea on the Sea of Marmara. Uh, and uh, this capital eventually over time will become the capital of what will be now called the Eastern Roman Empire or Byzantine Empire as well. And um, originally the capital uh, was going to be called uh, New Rome or I think the other name is Nova, Roma. That's what they were going to call it. That's what he wanted to call it initially. You can see Constantinople, uh, which is right there. 
I was the name that, that, you know, the, he wanted to call it, but the people wanted to name it after him. And so it got named Constantinople, the city of Constantine. And so that's the name that stood for many years, you know, up through the Middle Ages uh, until the Turks came in and, you know, took Constantinople in 1453. They renamed it now Istanbul, you know, which is the modern name, uh, you know, which you're looking at right there uh, in that picture. Uh, they do think that the um, actual city, the, this Christian city that he founded uh, back then, uh, was founded on an old ancient Greek city called Byzantium or Byzantium, like he called it. Uh, and so he built it on top of that city. Uh, and so that's sometimes where the name Byzantine or some people say Byzantine is the name they usually nicknamed the Eastern Roman Empire uh, that would you know, evolve over time. So I guess he's kind of considered like the founder of what would be later the Byzantine Empire uh, and its future capital that you're looking at right there. Yeah, there's a kind of a map showing you, but that's basically where it's based. Uh, you can see right below the Black Sea. Uh, it's kind of between almost like Turkey and Greece now today, but it's like located where the Sea of Mara Mara is, and it was built on a heavily fortified peninsula uh, to prevent people from attacking it. And also it was right where the trade routes are, going from east to west, you know, with Asia, trade with Asia and all that. But the Byzantine Empire would kind of grow in size uh, to about the 6th century under Emperor Justinian the Great. Uh, and then after that, it shrank over time uh, in the Middle Ages. Yeah, also, uh, Constantine also had a dynasty, Constantinian dynasty, if you can see. So uh, actually had three sons that reigned afterwards. Constantine the first, uh, of course, reigned first. Uh, and then he had his son, Constantine the second, Constans, and Constantius the second. So he had three different sons uh, that would rule. And I think Julian was, a, I want to say, a, um, a nephew of his uh, that reigned briefly, 361 to 363. He's very famous. He's sometimes called Julian the, the Apostate uh, because he was this uh, last emperor that was a pagan, like the only one they have left. And after that, all the emperors are Christian uh, in the West and East and all that. Now, let me move on. I want to talk for a few minutes about Theodosius the Great. He's another great emperor that comes in later. Uh, and um, one thing that happens in the Roman Empire, it eventually splits permanently. If you know about this, uh, most Romans don't view it as that. Uh, they see it kind of as like two courts, one in the West, one in the East. Uh, you know, but pretty much they think around close to 400, the empire is going to split permanently into two separate empires. And a lot to do with this emperor that you're looking at right here, Theodosius the Great. He's also called Theodosius the First uh, as well. Uh, in fact, he actually creates two of the last major dynasties, they think. Uh, the one in the east, I think, was the Theodosian dynasty. There was one in the west called the Valentinian dynasty uh, as well. Uh, and um, what happened was he seized control of the empire for a few years. Like he was actually reigning back in 379 uh, as the Eastern Roman emperor. Uh, and then for a few years, like I want to say two or three years, uh, he briefly took control uh, of the Western empire and became its like last sole rule that would rule over both of them. Uh, and uh, he had to also fight off, like, the Goths again. Like, that's another problem. They keep having problems with the Goths. Because uh, I think it was a case where one of the even Roman emperors had been killed, Emperor Valens, uh, fighting against the Goths. Uh, the, I think it was the Visigoths. Uh, and um, so, yeah, what he does, he decides to divide the whole thing up is one thing he's going to do uh, later on. You're going to see this case where West and East, uh, it's divided up. Before I get to that, though, there's something he does before that that's very famous. He issues this edict that's called the Edict of Thessalonica. Uh, and what that does uh, is it makes Nicene Christianity, not other Christian Christian forms like they have Arian Christianity that was also around, but Nicene Christianity, you know, based on the first consul of Nicaea, that becomes the state church of the Roman Empire. 
Uh, Thessalonica is a city in like where Macedonia was in northern Greece now, uh, but he issued it from there. Uh, and so what, one of the things that happened afterwards, if you know about Theodosius, he began trying to actually stamp out paganism. So if you were pagan, like a pagan religion, uh, you were persecuted. <laughs> it's kind of like reversed, I guess, of what happened after that. Uh, and then you can see he even went further, and I think we've talked about it before when we were talking about the Greeks. He banned the Olympics uh, in 393 too, as well. Uh, so, yeah, that's what, something that's kind of famous about that, of uh, course. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing he did, like I said, was he split split the Roman Empire in half. Uh, he died in 395, uh, controlling both halves. And he took his two main sons, Honorius and Arcadius, uh, and he put Honorius as the ruler in the West. So he became the Western Roman Emperor, uh, and then Arcadius became the emperor in the East. Uh, and uh, so you get these two separations of the empire after that. And so the empire just does not get back together again. There's no more rulers that reign over both halves, uh, you know, from, from then on out. So that's one of the things that happened. And uh, the one on the left, uh, Honorius, uh, he was actually famous for moving the capital of Rome. Uh, it, Rome was the capital, you know, for years up to that time in the early 5th century. But in 408 CE, uh, he moved the capital to Ravenna, to the north, close to uh, what is on the Adriatic Sea. It's not that far from Venice. Uh, and uh, he did that for defensive purposes because um, they thought Rome would get attacked, which it did. <laughs> and the Goths came down. I think uh, I think it was one of the groups that attacked it. I know Goths and the Vandals both attack it uh, and sack it. Uh, and so it was more defensible right there uh, in that in that location. And so that becomes the later capital of the Roman Empire in the West. That they have most people don't know about that, uh, but that's something that's true of course, at the end of the Roman Empire in the West. Now, they do have one last major ruler that does reign in the West, Valentinian III. They consider him to be one of the last major rulers that really is a pretty good ruler that, that's in power for about, you can see, 30 years. Uh, and uh, he's one of the longest reigning Western emperors uh, that you have. Uh, he actually uh, was able to fight off a lot of barbarian invasions. That's one of the things that he had to deal with as emperor in the West, uh, Valentinian III, especially trying to fight off the Huns. And part of it was because of the fact that he had a lot of great generals uh, that were under him. I think the two big generals uh, that were under that period were, uh, I don't think it was one called Felix, I know, but the one that was the most famous was Flavius Aetius. Uh, who helped fight off the Huns uh, and all that. And uh, during this time period, you have a period that comes in called the Migration Period, where the Roman Empire is repeatedly invaded by barbarians, is what they called them back then. I think even up to modern times, they call them the barbarian invasion. Uh, and uh, they're kind of a mix of mostly Germanic peoples and other uh, Eurasian peoples that come out of the East uh, and attack uh, the Roman Empire, the West and the East as well. And um, there's like a different ones that they call, you know, kind of get involved in that, that invade the Roman Empire. But this goes on for many centuries, like fourth century, I think is when it starts. Uh, then you can even, even go up to like the time of the Vikings. You got different peoples that invade Europe uh, at one point. Uh, and uh, they have a German name for it, by the way. Uh, it's often called the um, Volker Wandering, which means in um, German, the wandering of the people. So you have all these Germanic peoples mostly that start leaving Germany or Germania, start going into the empire. Uh, the reason why they did this was because uh, they wanted to go live in the Roman Empire where things are better, I guess, economically. Kind of like people in Latin America want to come to America, right? It's kind of like that. Uh, practically, you know, invading across the Rio Grande. Uh, and um, so that's, yeah, one thing like that. And then also um, a lot of them were also fleeing like the Huns and others. Uh, they were invading Europe uh, as well. They were terrorized by the Huns. And so some of them fled them as well. Uh, so, yeah, what's going to happen 
This is going to lead to the fall of the Western Empire. It's one of the big things that occurs where the Western Empire gets conquered uh, by all these different barbarians uh, that invade uh, that state uh, in the West. Uh, and um, here's kind of an image of it right here. But yeah, those are some of the different groups that come in uh, that are famous. So the Germans, you got like the Goths, uh, there's different Goths I'll get into in a second, Franks, uh, the Vandals, uh, the Burgundians uh, also come in, different Anglo-Saxons, uh, such as the Angles, uh, the uh, Saxons, the Jutes, uh, which are kind of uh, similar uh, also, uh, I don't have in there also as well, but um, I think the Alemanni, I think, was another one. The Lombards, I think, was another group uh, that came in. Uh, Eurasians that were either like Eastern Europe or Asian, uh, Avars, Magyars, Bulgars, of course, the Huns also as well. Uh, the Alans, I think, was another group that also came in uh, as well. So all these different peoples that kind of come in uh, to the empire uh, at one point. But the Huns, we'll get to in a second later, they were the most fierce, of course, that attacked the Western Empire, also the Eastern Empire as well. Here's kind of a map, you know, of the Roman Empire. Uh, they think most of this period of the migration period where the barbarians invade the West, it's mostly around 100 years, uh, from about maybe 376 to 378, because uh, actually in the 4th century, the Romans let the Goths come into the empire and settle there. And they created internal conflicts uh, within, within the empire. But here's kind of a map that they sometimes use to describe all the different uh, barbarian invasions uh, that attacked the Roman empire. I'll kind of go through some of the ones that were kind of famous. Uh, the Visigoths, uh, they're really the first group that really attacks the West. Oh, that's kind of famous. Under this king named King Alaric, they actually march westward from the eastern part of the empire uh, through like Dalmatia, where um, Yugoslavia used to be, and into Italy. They actually sacked Rome in 410. Uh, and then from there, they pushed westward into where Spain is now. Uh, and if you know about what happened with the Visigoths, the Visigoths would take over Spain and they would create their own state that was called the Visigothic Kingdom, which would, by the way, last till the early Middle Ages to about 721 uh, CE uh, when Muslim conquerors would take over Spain like the Moors. Uh, and then they have also the Ostrogoths, which were a cousin of the Visigoths. They later would attack Italy as well. They take it over uh, in the late 5th century. They have their own kingdom, also later Ostrogothic kingdom, which reigns to about 553 CE as well. Uh, then that video was talking about the Vandals, uh, which came out of Germany too. Uh, the Vandals attacked the Western Empire as well. And uh, in 455 CE, under this king named Gazeric, they attacked Rome again, sacked it. Uh, but the Vandals were more known uh, for seizing control of North Africa. They had their own kingdom called the Vandal Kingdom as well, uh, which you can see reigned from the 5th into the 6th century CE. And uh, they actually took control of, like, North Africa, where Carthage used to be. Uh, they seized control of Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica, and actually reigned it for a short time until Justinian, the Byzantine Empire, destroyed their kingdom in the 6th century. Uh, also, the Franks, they're kind of famous later in the Middle Ages, uh, they invade uh, into France, uh, called Gaul back then, and Gaul falls as well. Gaul's eventually going to you know, fall to the Franks, and they'll form their own kingdom too, uh, called the Kingdom of the Franks uh, by about 481 CE, uh, which they called it Francia or France. Uh, and so that's something that's really going to lead into uh, the early Middle Ages. And then also, don't forget, you've got other peoples like the Angles and the Saxons, the Jews, so they're called Anglo-Saxon peoples. They come out of Northern Europe, like Germany and Denmark, uh, using ships, and they attack Rome and Britain. They seize that too. 
uh, as well. No farm their own states later. Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, like you see there, East Anglica, Mercia, Northumbria, Wessex, etc. Uh, all those kings are kind of famous. Like Wessex is, you know, Alfred the Great uh, rules over England later. Uh, and so basically the West is being taken over by these different barbarians uh, between the 4th and 5th centuries. So, yeah, it's kind of a kind of a mess right there, but that's what happens. The Eastern Empire gets attacked too, but uh, their emperors are more stronger. Uh, their armies are better uh, in the West. A lot of the Western uh, emperors are having to rely on mercenaries is one of the things that happened. And a lot of them were Germans, and the Germans, you know, eventually will just take over the empire uh, in the West uh, because of that. Now, they also have the Huns, which really that particular group was the most feared by people in Europe, uh, not just in the Western part, uh, but in the Eastern Roman Empire uh, as well. And uh, who were the Huns? The Huns were these nomadic peoples that came out of Eurasia, uh, and they attacked the Roman Empire. They attacked the Eastern Roman Empire and also the Western Roman Empire, and they were notorious as great warriors. They fought on horseback, just like the Mongols did later. They fought with composite bow. Uh, and uh, there's different theories on the origins of the Huns. They think the Huns were likely uh, these um, Asiatic peoples that they think came out of like Central Asia, like very close to where Mongolia is today. If you remember correctly, we had talked about the Xiongnu. Uh, they had attacked China years ago. I think there's a theory that Huns may have been descended from them and maybe the later Mongols uh, as well. Here's kind of a map showing you uh, the Hunnic Empire. Uh, it was called, uh, some people later call it the Empire of Attila, uh, who, of course, is one of their most famous rulers that they have. Uh, but they think it was a type of empire that stretched from, like, Russia and, like, the Ukraine all the way uh, into Eastern Central Europe. So they controlled territory. They went all the way, probably westward, close to where Hungary is today. In fact, the name Hungary is evolved from the name Hun, uh, if you know about that. Uh, and um, it wasn't just Huns like that were in it. They had other people, like I think a lot of Germans joined it as well. So it was kind of a coalition of like Huns and Germanic tribes uh, that formed this empire. And uh, they had a capital, which they think was close to Budapest, but I'm not sure if they know the name of it, but it was in a region that the Romans called Pannonia, uh, is a common name of the area that's close to where Hungary and I guess Austria is today. Uh, of course, Attila the Hun, uh, as you know, uh, was their greatest king. Uh, he would reign, you can see, almost 20 years uh, as a ruler and a lot of people in Europe, especially Christians, called him the scourge of God because uh, they thought they were sent, sent by God to punish uh, them. Uh, in fact, the Huns themselves were called the scourge of the earth. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of the Huns uh, were pagan. They weren't traditionally cr Christian, I know. Uh, and they were known for butchering cities. When they would take a city, they would just kill everybody there, men, women, and children, and Tilla didn't care. He just killed everybody. Uh, and so he kind of got a bad name uh, because of that. Uh, but he was, like I said, a feared warrior and king. Uh, that was, of course, the most famous, of course, of their rulers. Uh, here's kind of, of course, an image showing you. But yeah, there, of course, uh, Tilla the Hun, of course, or just Attila, of course, king of the Huns. But yeah, he would form this alliance uh, that would be created uh, between various Huns, uh, and Germanic tribes uh, in Central Europe. And he would use that actually to form a huge army. I think there's a theory that his armies were like 200,000 troops at one point, mostly fighting on horseback like cavalry. Uh, and he would use this to attack the Roman Empire because his plan was to basically seize the Roman Empire and maybe even become an emperor uh, in right. Uh, here's kind of a map here, uh, kind of showing a picture here, excuse me, of um, the Huns. Huns first go after the Eastern Roman Empire, 
uh, the ruler in the east was this emperor named Theodos II. He was a grandson of Theodos the Great, the Theodosian dynasty. He had to fight off the attack of the Huns. Uh, and um, because of that, uh, the, if you know about what happened in the east, they built this huge fortification that's called the Theodosian Walls that were built to protect uh, the, Bi the Byzantine Empire's uh, capital of Constantinople. Uh, and uh, these fortifications were, were mostly put in because of these barbarians. Uh, they were trying to attack the empire in the east, and it basically defended the western approaches uh, to the city of Constantinople. Uh, I think the average height of those walls you're looking at was something like 50 to 60 feet tall. Uh, and so that actually prevented the Huns from really taking uh, the city of Constantinople. Now, of course, what Attila is most famous for, uh, if you know about it, was in 451, uh, he tried to famously invade Gaul. And I can seize control of that, uh, what would be France. Uh, he was hoping to conquer the West and maybe even become the Western emperor, uh, of course. And, of course, you can see as he went uh, across what is now modern France today, he burned and massacred several cities, Worms, Mainz, Cologne, Trier, Metz, Reims, and a few other cities uh, were basically burned to the stake. Uh, he had a lot of the men, women, and children in those cities, uh, a lot of them that were captured and they were they were basically butchered uh, by the Huns. Uh, and uh, however, uh, what happened was the Romans were able to rally a force to defeat uh, Attila. There was this Roman general uh, that was named Flavius Aetius, uh, really considered one of the greatest Roman generals uh, in the 5th century. He had a nickname or title they gave him later, which was the last of the Romans. Uh, so one of the last great Roman generals, especially that fought in the West. And he put together a coalition army of Roman uh, and barbarian, which included like Visigoths, Franks, Saxons, Alans. Uh, and uh, they were able to beat uh, Attila's huge army at the Battle of Catalonian Fields, uh, which happened on June 20th, uh, 451. Uh, and uh, they do consider that battle, by the way, to be the last major battle that the Romans win uh, really in the West, like when the Western Empire exists, all that. Because uh, after that, you know, things deteriorate even further. Their empire is just taken over uh, by mostly Germans. Uh, and so that's going to help proceed to it later. But at that point, you know, Attila was defeated. And uh, Attila kept trying to fight, though. If you know about this, he then tried to attack Italy, uh, which he did uh, in 452. He tried to go after uh, Italy and seize that and maybe take the capital of Ravenna. Uh, and um, so he marched into northern Italy at that point. And uh, however, there was a case where the pope came out. Uh, if you know about this, there was a pope named Pope Leo I, also called Leo the Great. Uh, he actually went and met with Attila uh, in 452, and he somehow was able to talk Attila uh, into uh, basically leaving, like not attacking Italy uh, anymore. Uh, and so he marched out, and they're not sure what happened. I think there's a theory that maybe they just bribed him and paid tribute to him, like gave him a lot of money, and that's what caused him to you know, go back to basically Hungary uh, at that point. Uh, and so that's got kind of, kind, of, kind of what they think caused that to occur. But kind of bizarre thing, though. They think Attila was probably planning to attack him again, uh, maybe in 453 or 454. Uh, but apparently it was a case where Attila... Uh, on his wedding night, he was marrying this young woman, a uh, bride, uh, and he had a horrible nosebleed, and he drowned in his own blood. Uh, and so Attila, Attila died after that, uh, and so his, his empire, the Hunnic Empire, collapsed afterwards. Now, what occurred after that, they had one more major ruler that kind of reigns in the West that's real famous, you may have heard about. Uh, his name is Romulus Augustus. 
Uh, what happens uh, by 476, the Germans that told you were trying to take over the West, they start taking control. And what they do is they actually depose the last major Western Roman emperor. It was done by this German general named Odo Acer. Uh, and he kind of made him step down at that point. You're kind of, kind of an image of him right here, Romulus Augustulus, as he's called. And uh, he only reigned for about 10 months. He may have been a teenager, I think, real, real young, like 12, maybe, when he came to power. Not sure about how old he was exactly. Uh, but uh, he was forced to basically step down uh, at that point. Maybe he was 14 of the oldest, they think, maybe when he abdicated uh, his throne. And he went into retirement. Uh, they're not sure what happened to him. I think some people think he may have lived into the 6th century, 511. Some people think he may have even lived up to the 540s, uh, they think, uh, as well, uh, Romulus Augustus. But the name is ironic. Uh, his first name, Romulus, you know, is named for the first Roman king. And then you got Augustus, right, is a variation of the first Roman emperor, Augustus. I think Augustus actually means little August. Is what it means. Uh, and so basically when he steps down at that point, there's no more Western emperors uh, after that, uh, after 476. So uh, one thing that happened, if you know about it, there was this famous uh, historian named Edward Gibbon in the 18th century wrote this series of books called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which is probably the greatest series of books uh, ever written about the Roman Empire. And he's the one that popularized the idea that uh, 476 was the date when the Roman Empire collapsed. Uh, and so from then on, there's only one empire afterwards, uh, which is more in the east that they have. Uh, so really what happened was, you kind of show you a map right here, but the eastern Roman em emperor that's over there, I think his name was Emperor Zeno, he's actually the sole emperor of the whole thing, but in the West, they don't recognize an emperor anymore. They start carving up their own kingdoms uh, at that point, like Germanic or barbarian kingdoms kind of form afterwards. Uh, and uh, you get the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire that emerges uh, after that. It's actually going to continue uh, up through the Middle Ages. In fact, the Byzantine Empire collapses in 1453 CE. So they had a lot of influence, the Romans, on history, like 2,000 years, um, you know, influencing all kinds of people uh, over time. Uh, but you can see it shrank over time. I think under Justinian the Great in this mid-6th century, he actually would take back part of the West, like North Africa, Spain, and Italy. Uh, but over time in the Middle Ages, it shrank uh, until it became a small state. And then the Ottoman Empire, if you know about it, conquered it in 453. They took the city of Constantinople. So after that, you know, you then get the Middle Ages that come in afterwards uh, with the fall of the Roman Empire. And that's basically, you know, where we're at uh, after that. Now, I did want to talk about a few things. That's pretty much going to end my lecture, of course, for the Roman Empire. But I did want to talk about some of the end of semester grades. Uh, that we do have coming up. I just got a kind of a slide I kind of made here, but I am going to put this in Canvas announcements later. But these are the major assignments uh, at the end of the semester that are still out. Third key terms of vocabulary assignment, of course. I'm going to leave that open throughout this whole week. If you haven't turned it in yet, you need to get that in. If you're going to be exempt for the final, you need to turn that in. Book reports due by April 28th, Friday as well. Canvas quiz number five. Early Roman history, 44 BC. Uh, that course uh, will be due. I'll probably put that up to the end of the semester in finals week as well. Now, we have assignments coming up that I'll add later, uh, which will be next week, mon uh, Monday, May 1st. I'll put it up. Final exam on the Roman Empire, which I am working on a review on that. So I'm going to kind of, like I did on the first, second exams, I will have something like that for you later. Uh, I also going to have a final exam bonus quiz, like I did on the second exam. That will be on the Middle Ages, which will be based on recorded lectures I previously made before, which those will probably be posted. I want to say maybe sometime this week. 
uh, that I have. That'll be due by, of course, you see also Friday, May 12th during finals. No extensions on those, by the way, after May 12th. Uh, also, bonus assignments remaining due. First, second, final exam study guides. Those are due by Friday, May 12th. Uh, if you're doing those veterans project, by the way, uh, that is due Saturday, May 13th. Also, if you're doing the student historical documentary project, I think I'll probably leave that open until Saturday, May 13th as well. I'll allow up to two attempts on that, by the way, you can turn in. Uh, end of semester makeups. I usually do this sometimes, and I'll probably do it again this semester. Uh, May 1st to May 7th, I'll have makeups. Uh, those could be on exams you missed, like the first, second exams, quiz that you missed uh, as well, uh, vocabulary that you missed. Uh, no bonus makeups, though, on bonus assignments uh, overall. So uh, if you know you have a, something you missed that you want to make up, do email me. Let me know what you want to make up. Also, student exemptions from the final exam. Uh, if students have a 96% or higher grade, uh, you can be exempt from the final. Uh, you do have to turn in your remaining assignments. I think those are the three things I want you to turn in and or complete. Canvas quiz number five on early Roman history, third vocabulary, of course, the book report uh, as well. Uh, and uh, you do have an option to take the final. Of course, you can also take the final exam bonus quiz. So I think that's probably worth, I'm not sure how many points it'll be, but 40, 50 bonus points, something like that will probably be. Uh, but those are basically some, you know, end of the semester grades uh, that I'm going to have, of course. I'll, by the way, post that, like I said, uh, in um, campus announcements sometime today. I'll put that up so kind of remind you, but I'll be sending out announcements about different grades uh, that are due or different announcements that are kind of important toward the semester. Uh, I'll also have a list later, not now, but later as we get closer to finals. I uh, will kind of have a list of students that are exempt from the final on uh, things like that uh, as well. It uh, looks like Christian had joined us, I think, uh, I think earlier, so I didn't get to say hey to you, Christian, uh, as well, but good morning, all that. Uh, but that's it for this lecture. So like I said, this is my last live lecture. So I uh, hope you all have a you know great rest of the uh, semester uh, in the spring. Um, so if you want to take me for 1123, I'll probably have a class on that later. Uh, History 1123 is kind of like a continuation uh, of this period from like probably the late Middle Ages up through modern times. Uh, as well. Uh, but I'll have middle age lectures I'll have for you too as well, which uh, I'll have like mostly just probably main topics uh, that are important for that period. Uh, but I'll have those up for you later overall. So y'all have a great rest of the semester uh, overall. If you see me on campus, you know, do talk to me on things like that, of course, uh, as well. Uh, so y'all have a great weekend coming up. Uh, also, so no more, no more live lectures for, of course, the rest of the semester. So y'all take care uh, and have a great rest of the year.